Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started here. Um, I'm Kim Biasioli. I'm the Natural Resources Manager for Albemarle County. And uh, we're so glad to have you here today for the second webinar in our community learning series. Um, if you missed the first one, which was last week, that was the introduction to the rural area. And there was a focus on historical and current land and water use. Um, you can find the recording on our Facebook page and also on our public input site, uh, publicinput.com slash streamhealth. And this webinar series is going to be every Friday um, from noon to one until April 9th. So we hope you'll come back and join us again for some of the other topics that, that we have lined up. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the Stream Health Initiative, uh, the goal of this project is to develop strategies for improving stream health in the county. And we're really doing this in collaboration with all of you as members of the community and also with the technical expertise of professionals from other organizations, like the ones that we have with us today from the Rivanna Water and Sewer Authority. And I will get to introducing them and their talk in just a moment. But before I do, I just wanna go through a few quick tips about Zoom and our webinar today. Uh, so today's event is primarily presentation based, but we will have some time for questions at the end. Uh, if you do have questions, you can add them into uh, the Q&A box. Uh, you will not be able to use the chat. It's disabled uh, for participants, but we, you might see chats coming from us out to you, to the whole group. Um, so uh, you'll see that Q&A icon in the webinar toolbar if you're joining by computer. Um, and we will try to try our best to answer them either during the presentation or, or at the end. Uh, if you've called in and you have a question by phone, uh, please reserve your questions for the end and then you can raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine. Uh, and then uh, we can unmute you and you'll be able to actually ask your question. Uh, just for everyone's awareness, this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on our website um, probably at some point next week. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers from the Rivanna Water and Sewer Authority. Uh, Andrea Bowles is the Water Resources Manager and Jennifer Whitaker is the Director of Engineering and Maintenance. And they are going to talk to us about our local water supply source water protection and how they're planning for future demands. So with that, I will turn it over to them. All right, I think I'm all set up. Uh, this is Andrea Bowles. I am the Water Resources Manager at Rivanna. Um, I've worked for Rivanna a total of, I think a total of 14 years, somewhere in there. Um, and Jennifer Whitaker is going to speak. We're going to tag team this a little bit. So we'll get started. Um, thanks for the introduction, Kim. And can every, Kim, is my vocal, my uh, sound working correctly? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talk about water supply and planning for future demands, as well as source water protection. We're throwing in um, several topics and we're kind of hitting the high points. Uh, and the intent is to, if there's something that is really interesting to you and you wanna know more, please use a question and answer for later. Um, and also, of course, Jennifer and I are both available. If you ever have questions, you can call us at our offices too. So here's our agenda for today. We're going to tell you a little bit about who we are, Ravana Water and Sewer Authority. Um, we're going to talk about water supply and our watersheds um, and where our sources come from. We're going to talk about the history of our water supply and sort of permitting, permitting and how we came to have what we have today. We're going to talk about demands and safe yield source water quality a little bit and it's some also in stream flows. So RWSA provides wholesale drinking water and wastewater treatment for only two customers, 
So we are the ones that have kind of the bigger pipes and we bring treated water, we treat the water, we bring it through the system and then ACSA, the city of Charlottesville and UVA all pull treated water off of that. So if you are a resident of Albemarle County or the city, um, you get your water from us, but your bill goes to the city or Albemarle County. So we were found in 1973 for the sole purpose of providing water and wastewater services for the city of Charlottesville, portions of Albemarle County and the University of Virginia. Like I said, we have two customers, just two, City of Charlottesville, which they actually, um, they actually send it to UVA. UVA is not a direct customer of ours and the Albemarle County Service Authority. We serve about 110,000 people in Charlottesville and the urban area around Charlottesville. And our current average daily demand is about 10 million gallons a day. Uh, we are governed by a seven person board of directors um, with members, representatives of the city, the county, the service authority, and an at, at large member as well. So here's just some um, kind of key facts for you to consider. So we have a proposed five year CIP right now of $169.7 million. We have a lot of projects that we're working on and a lot that are coming. Um, we have an operating budget of 37.1 million. I think we have somewhere around 100 employees. Assets are, are 275 million. We have six dams, five reservoirs, five water treatment plants, four wastewater facilities. Um, and what you'll see is that the storage, total storage of our five reservoirs um, is 3.4 billion gallons of storage. And the water treatment plants can produce a total all collectively together as a whole, we can produce 19.6. Um, our largest water treatment plant, we, which is South Ravana water treatment plant, we produce 12 is the maximum. And for the wastewater facilities, similar statistics. So let's talk a little bit about the supply and watersheds. So this is a, a nice graphic, I like it, um, it's a good, overview to Rivanna and where the water goes and where, where it's from and where it goes. So you can see Albemarle County here around the back. Um, and then what you'll notice is we have the urban water system and everything that has the arrows pointing there, that represents the urban water system. So in terms of sources, we have the North Fork Rivanna River intake. We have the South Fork Rivanna Reservoir, Sugar Hollow Reservoir, Ragged Mountain Reservoir. Now, all of those sources get treated and sent out to the urban system. So there's a water treatment plant at the North Fork, at, at North Fork Ravana River intake. There's the South Ravana water treatment plant. Um, Ragged Mountain goes to the observatory water treatment plant. And then you'll see we have these um, Beaver Creek is listed here and it's a little bit, um, it's different because it has its own system. It is not connected in any way to the urban system and it's served by Beaver Creek Reservoir. Same with um, Scottsville. They have their own water source, which is the Toadier Creek uh, Reservoir and intake. Um, and you can sort of see what we're doing here. And I'm sure many of you have heard about um, what our future plans are to build a pipeline between South Fork Ravana Reservoir and Ragged Mountain Reservoir. So when that happens, it, the water will come this way. There will be an arrow there. And this, this indicates that um, Sugar Hollow is in the watershed of South Urbana and water from Sugar Hollow can flow through the river to South Urbana. It can also be piped right now. But when we put in this new pipe from South Urbana to, um, to Ragged Mountain, this will go away. We won't be using this pipe anymore. All right. Again, here's our watersheds, um, Almaroff County. The thing that I would like you to take away from this is uh, the size, the relative sizes of the watersheds. So South Urbana is um, 259 square miles. And within that watershed, Sugar Hollow Reservoir is in that watershed, and so is Beaver Creek Reservoir. 
the uh, Ragged Mountain Reservoir, which you know is our newest and holds the most water. It holds 1,441 million gallons. It has the smallest watershed, which is uh, two square miles, less than two square miles. And that is why it has to have a source of water from somewhere else, which right now is Sugar Hollow and in the future will be South Urbana. Again, the urban reservoirs, South Fork, Sugar Hollow, and Ragged Mountain. Um, here's some statistics again on the volume, surface areas, and watersheds. And you can really see the big difference between the sizes of the watersheds. And then we have the Crozet and Scottsville reservoirs <clears throat> down here, and they're smaller. Um, and their watersheds are 10 and 29 square miles. So as I said, the water treatment plants um, provide the service of treating the water from the reservoirs. This is, oops, I'm sorry. This is, a, is the observatory water treatment plant on the UVA grounds. This is South Urbana, a nice aerial shot looking down and this is the North Urbana water treatment plant. All right, water supply history, demand, and safe field. We're going to move into that, and Jennifer Whitaker is going to talk about these items. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Um, just to give everybody a little bit of history, um, the urban water supply system uh, has existed in Charlottesville since the mid-1800s. It originally started as a well system. The university had a variety of cisterns and um, piping systems. And eventually the city and the university worked together to establish the water supply system in the late 1800s. And some of our infrastructure dates back to the 1880s and early 1900s. And so um, the regional water supply system has really existed since the mid early 1970s um, through the formation of Rivanna. And we were tasked with, as it relates to this topic, with um, managing and ensuring that there's adequate safe drinking water um, available to the community um, for current and future needs. So that's um, under the Administrative Code of Virginia. That is how we are tasked with doing uh, water supply planning is to make sure that we can meet not only today's needs, but the future needs as well. And anyone who's been involved in water supply permitting understands that sometimes it takes a very long time to make decisions and to get all the necessary permitting. So it's a, it's a bit of an ongoing process. So how did we get to where we are today? So in 2001 and 2002, there was an 18 month severe drought in central Virginia. It is considered the drought of record. Um, the official hydrologic record goes all the way back to the late 1800s. And prior to this, there was a drought in 1930s that uh, was considered the drought of record. But the 2001-2002 drought usurped that and became sort of the, the standard by which you judge whether you've got enough water supply. So it sparked a 10 to 12 year long water supply planning process. And that process included probably close to 50 community meetings, um, just extensive study over the period of about 10 years. And in the end, the community, we evaluated over 32 different alternatives and selected um, a drink local um, alternative where we had control over the watershed. And the community water supply plan was uh, approved and signed into, uh, into, into being in 2012. And that included several key items. Um, it included expanding the Ragged Mountain Reservoir by building a new dam at Ragged Mountain. It included the raw, wa raw water line that Andrea mentioned that will be built in the future from South Urbana to Ragged Mountain. In fact, uh, over a mile of that pipeline's already built at uh, the Birdwood Golf Course. And there's other sections that are planned in the near future. It also included renovation of both the South Urbana and Observatory Water Treatment Plant. Those are under construction right now. Those largely untouched since the uh, 50s for observatory and the 80s for South Urbana. So these are pretty major plant upgrades. And then replacement of all the raw water piping from the Ragged Mountain Reservoir to the observatory treatment plant. Most of that piping is from the 1920s um, and some of it even older than that. And so um, it's uh, met its useful life and is planned to be replaced. So when we consider water supply, how do we decide when enough is enough? 
And uh, it's a great question. And it's a little more complex probably than I, we have time to completely get into, but I, we'll talk a little bit about it here. So things we consider when we look at water supply, we look at what the local rainfall quantities and patterns are. We go all the way back to the hydrologic record. So we look back to the 1800s, but really focus on data, sort of modern hydrologic data is available on a daily basis since the 1920s. And so we look at day by day rainfall and precipitation patterns. We look at flows in the rivers and the reservoirs. We look at hydraulic modeling. We look at bathymetric surveys or surveys of the bottoms of reservoirs so that we can look over time how they change. We look at local weather and the drought of record. And then we look at that information and model both going backwards and going forwards, um, looking at on a day by day basis, how much water is available in the system and whether that's adequate for the drought of record. And so there's really this yield concept, which is how much can the system supply? And the, the, there's sort of two types of yield. One is safe yield by pure definition, which is how much water is in the system. And then the second is what we call operational yield, which is given all the constraints that exist within the system, how much water are we able to get out of the system and provide to the tap? And so currently there's about enough water for 18, an average of 18.6 million gallons per day over the duration of the drought. And the operational yield is about 12.8 million gallons per day. And that 12.8 really is the number that we use to look at um, because it, it takes into account all of the existing limitations in the rivers, the pipes, the treatment plants, all of those types of things. So that is the amount of water we can safely supply. So if we look at the avail this graph here, um, in 2020, we updated both our yield study and our demand study. And this is some of the information that came out of that 2020 update. Um, we will update these numbers at, at a minimum of every 10 years um, and more often if we feel like it's necessary based on what we're seeing in the system. So you, what you'll see here is the 12.8 that we talked about in the last slide of operational safe yield. Um, currently, the water treatment plants are being upgraded, which will allow us to go to that 15.1 number in 2023. And then what you'll see is a pretty constant down gradient of demand of, excuse me, of yield all the way back to 2070 of 12.8. And that number, uh, the reason we go from 15.1 to 12.8 over time is it accounts for the sedimentation in the South Fork Ravana River and the loss of storage in that system over time. So this next graph, um, and again, this, this information will be available online afterwards and we're happy to talk about any detail. Also, these two studies are available on our website. So if anyone is interested in looking at these two studies in more detail, we can either make them available to you or they're available on the Rivanna website. So this graph, sorry, Andrea, could you back up if you don't mind? Great, thank you. Um, so this is a population forecast for the area. So what we did is, um, and we've done this several times in the last decade, is we worked closely with city staff, neighborhood development, as well as utility staff. We worked with Albemarle County development staff, uh, Albemarle County Service Authority, uh, as well as the university. And we looked at populations, current buildable areas. We looked at Weldon Cooper data. We looked at Census Bureau data. We looked at uh, VDOT road planning data and Put together what we believe to be a basically a 50-year projection of demand uh, based on population. And so the urban area population um, looks to be like a 2070 projection of about 170,000 people. And if you can go to the next slide. So what's interesting about the 170,000 people is that we have been having a urban system demand of 10 million gallons a day, probably for the last decade. That does not mean we haven't seen growth in the community because we have, but what we are seeing in locally as well as on a national trend is that the per capita water use, so the amount of water a single person uses in a single day has dropped dramatically in the last decade to 15 years. And what you'll see here on the left is the city's data going all the way back to the mid eighties. And it, for, for very long periods of time, decades. Typically a, a person used about 110 to 120 
gallons per person per day. And what you'll see is that currently we're about 60 gallons per person per day. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the Albemarle County Service Authority, same trends. Again, we're in the 60 to 65 gallons per person per day. And so what has happened over the last 10 years, 15 years, is that as the population's increased, the per capita use has decreased and our, as such, our demands held pretty steady. Um, it's probably worth noting that Charlottesville is amongst the lowest per capita use um, communities in the country. We've done some review of data across uh, many other sort of conservation minded small cities and uh, our numbers are, are fairly low compared to uh, even other, other uh, similar minded uh, communities. So, so the question is, um, you know, certainly for the last 10 to 15 years, this has been the trend is that the per capita use goes down, total demand stays pretty, pretty steady. Um, the thought in the water world at the moment is that that per capita use um, maybe hasn't hit bottom yet, but but probably is close to hitting hitting the hitting bottom. So then, as, as population increases, so will water demand over time. And so what you'll see in this graph is the the green dots on the left represent historical finished water production. The blue line is a population slash demand projection we did in 2011 based on the information available at the time. And you can see that the community really anticipated about 17 million gallons per day demand in 2060. Um, our most recent forecast for urban water demand is the green line that uh, starts at 10.41 in 2020 and goes to 14.3 in 2070. And so when we look at uh, 10,000 foot view, when we're looking at water supply and demand, we overlay these two pieces of information. And what you'll see is the white bars with the white numbers is the yield, the operational yield we talked about previously. And then the green line is the demand as we see it um, based on current projections. And so approximately 2060 is when those two numbers cross each other. And um, typically you'll wanna start you want to have water in place and ready to go by that point. And so we typically start designing for improvements to ensure that we don't miss that window uh, at the 85% mark. So somewhere in the decade before we would start planning and building um, to expand that water supply. And just a quick summary. Again, we're looking at a 2070 population of 171,000 people. Uh, with an available supply of about 12.8 million gallons per day with a demand of 14.3. So there's a gap there that would need to be met. And so we'll need additional water supply by 2060 and typically by 2045 is when we would be working on um, doing that expansion. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrea to talk a little bit about source water quality. Um, Jennifer? Yes. Oh, we have a question about uh, future water supply protections that um, maybe you, you want to take it now? Sure, no problem. Okay. What uh, could you... so The question is, uh, since the 2001 drought, climate change has increased precipitation rates with record rates recorded in Virginia last year. Has RWSA included climate change impacts for future water supply projections? So to answer that question, um, we, we have been talking about climate prediction and climate impacts. Um, the real question for us is, um, unfortunately, we deal on both extremes. So on the, the precipitation patterns are more erratic um, and are predicted to become more erratic. So longer droughts, deeper droughts, and higher wetter seasons. And so what the high and the wet seasons impact us from a treatability standpoint on our source water quality. And then they also impact us from a dam safety and um, hydrology standpoint. So on, on the high end of things, we certainly, um, the state of Virginia and the federal government have looked at um, more recent hydrologic models and our dam safety program is designed around those higher intensity storms. Uh, for instance, we look at a, um, a probable maximum flood for this region of over 31 inches of rain in a 24-hour in period. 
and we design our dams to, to accommodate and address that. On the flip side is the deeper and long potential for deeper and longer droughts. And so as we look at our water supply um, and how we connect the pieces that we have, I think that's where the discussion surrounding the South Fork, the timing of the South Fork to Ragged Mountain Pipeline becomes very important. Um, originally, when we were thinking of that pipeline, we really were thinking of when, when do we need the extra capacity? And as time has passed and we continue to look at these issues, particularly surrounding climate change, the resiliency and redundancy that that pipeline provides, particularly if we have a drought that is worse than the drought of record, or we have uh, damage due to a high flood event, um, how we're able to respond to that has certainly um, become a bigger issue for us and a, and a bigger point of view. And so you will see that there's been discussions about moving portions, if not um, discussions about moving, continuing to move forward on getting that South Fork to Ragged Mountain Pipeline uh, in place to give us additional tools and flexibility. Okay. Um, if uh, there are any more questions right now, I'll keep going. I'm going to talk a little bit about source water quality. Well, I think I am. I am. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about reservoir water quality and how, how reservoirs function in general and um, how they change throughout the season. So in the springtime, you're looking at it, this being any reservoir, um, the, it, there's probably in the springtime, it's probably pretty isothermic, meaning it's all the same temperature, same dissolved oxygen. And then some things start happening. Um, and even this is even going on in the wintertime, but nutrients are flowing in from the streams and groundwater right into the reservoir, still in the spring. And nutrients feed algal growth, particularly phosphorus and nitrogen feed, feed algal growth. Um, so things get kind of cooking a little bit in the spring and start to go. Um, and as algae die, which they will um, after, I don't know exactly how long, but in a season, they, they don't last more than a season. They will die, turn up, and as they sink, they start to decompose. And that decomposition um, can that decomposition takes up oxygen so that in the summer, you've got the nutrients flowing in, like we talked, you've got the algal growth. And what happens is the upper part of the reservoir becomes warmer because of it's now summer. It becomes warmer and there, there becomes kind of a gradient in the middle of the reservoir that we call a thermocline. Um, and it separates out um, kind of into two different sections of the reservoir, or three if you include the thermocline acid section, an algae decomposition that consumes oxygen and nutrients are released out of the bottom sediments. And when there's a thermocline in place, they all kind of stay down here. There, and in that area, there's little or no oxygen. Fish don't want to be there because they don't have any oxygen to breathe. Um, and they only, they will set, stay primarily in the warmer area at the top, which has more oxygen. And again, this is still summer. And then in fall, same thing happens. We still have nutrients flowing in from streams and groundwater. But what happens is as the upper part of the reservoir, as, as it gets colder and the upper part of the reservoir starts to cool in the fall, um, it, <clears throat> it, turns over, so it becomes isothermic again, and the water cool, cools the cools, and the lake mixes, and it turns over, and when it does that, those nutrients that were in the bottom underneath the hypolimnion, um, they go up into the, all parts of the reservoir, and that can cause algal blooms in the fall. Um, and so in the winter, the reservoirs, again, they're, they sort of mentioned it at the beginning, but they're de-stratified. It's all uniform oxygen throughout the water column. Uh, fish move and are happy all the way through the water column. And in summertime, it's stratified. So this is just another way of looking at it, but this is the thermocline or metal limnion. There's an upper part of the reservoir we call the epilimnion, 
And that's where the fish will hang out because it's better, it's warmer, um, and it has dissolved oxygen in it. The hypolimnion in the summer does not, it's colder. There's little or no dissolved oxygen and the fish don't, don't hang out down there. So with respect to our reservoirs, we here are, I'm gonna talk a little bit about potential water quality concerns. So algal blooms, you've probably heard a lot about that in the news from however many years ago that was it Toledo had the really bad issue on Lake, on, uh, Lake Erie. And we've also heard about it close to home. We've had issues with, um, Lake Anna has had problems in the past two summers where they've had to close down parts. Um, Chris Green Lake has had some issues as well. Um, so algae and the concern for algae in your water systems is something that uh, water managers and utilities across the country have to look at very, very, very hard. So right now, um, Rivanna uses copper sulfate. It's a product called Cpro, and it is the lowest amount. It is supposed to be the lowest amount of copper needed to control. Um, and we use that to manage algae, but only when needed. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our monitoring and what we do for monitoring to know when we need to use it. So about 2014, we hired a consultant to look to, to one, look at our, our monitoring program and make recommendations for that. And also looked at 17 different management strategies and made recommendations for um, each of our reservoirs. And one of the recommendations that was made was to put a hypolimnetic oxygenation system in Beaver C Creek. So we basically will be <clears throat> oxygenating the lower part of the reservoir. And that project is going to move forward. It's in our CIP. And um, I think the neighborhood of time is within the next five years or so. Um, but that's one thing, one of the recommendations that we are moving forward with. And I kind of feel like looking at it in Beaver Creek, we're really hoping it's gonna help us. And, and if that's the case, this is kind of a pilot study for us with respect to that. So that's good. We also coordinate and um, share information and work with our partners at the county, um, the other agencies like Ravana Conservation Alliance and Thomas Jefferson Soil and Water. Um, and we all talk and share information and, and work on different projects together in source water protection. Um, and one of the other things that came out of that, I think I mentioned is that this proactive comprehensive reservoir monitoring. We had always done it before, but it's much more intensive now and very proactive. So just as a, uh, just as a touch on this, our sampling includes, we use an exosond, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute of what that looks like, and we take grab samples. Um, the sampling at each of the reser reservoirs is basically bi-weekly at the urban reservoirs. Um, in the summertime. And we also adjust that. There's times that we look at some indicators being like the weather forecast and reservoir levels. If it's, if the water is, if the reservoir is not spilling, it may be just holding in nutrients and it may be gonna have a problem with al al algae. Um, and so we, we take a look at all of that and also the appearance of the reservoir. This is an algal bloom on South Fork Ravana. Um, I think we have not had to treat South Fork Ravana for a couple of years <clears throat> because that reservoir works more like a river. Um, it's riverine and if most of the time, probably well above 95% of the time, that reservoir is spilling and it's pulling through what's in the reservoir. So again, we use the exoson, which it gives us water quality profiles. You lower it into the water and slowly move it down to, through the water column and it collects these pieces of information that we can then take back and examine in, um, in a spreadsheet and, and do you know analyses with that. And then we also do lab analyses, which are the grab samples I was talking about for nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, suspended solids, chlorophyll A and alkyl counts. And this one's kind of my favorite one is the Secchi disc. Um, it's kind of like, uh, to me, the simplest way to get an idea of what's going on in our reservoirs, and we do use it. 
Um, if you're familiar with what it is, it's a disc that has black and white quadrants and you, you stand and you lower it down into the reservoir and you take a note on the, um, on the depth at which you can't see it anymore. And we've done this for years and we know what the Secchi disc depth, depth that is probably starting to look like it has a problem. We know what those depths are for South Urbana. We know what they are for Beaver Creek um, and, the, and Ragged Mountain as well. So that's, I kind of like that oldie kind of, you can just make one, they're a great tool. So this is um, the Exosond, that is me several years ago. Um, and we lower it in, I'm getting ready to put it down in the, into the water and it sends the um, data back to a handheld that we then upload on the computer. And this is um, a camera sampler that we use to get the bottom water. So we lower it down when these uh, tubes are open and then we send a messenger, which is a, I don't think you can see it on the picture, but it has, it's a big heavy metal thing that flies down the rope and then trips this so it closes in. <clears throat> so that the water that comes up is, is definitely the bottom water. This is um, a team of our employees working for us um, on a nice boat. We have a, a boat that is specially designed so that we can put the sand down through the center, which is great. This is the camera sample or sampler that uh, we saw on the other screen. And this is a, an Ekman dredge which we used during a special study to look at the sediments in both Beaver Creek and South Urbana. And so one more thing that we really wanted to put out there and then if people have questions, we can talk more, speak more to this. But um, so as part of the permit process and as part of it, and it's written into our permit, but in part, in, in part of the, bleh, I can't talk when we were going through the permitting process, we collaborated with state and federal agencies, non-governmental organizations and interested parties and worked together to come up with a minimum in-stream flow for our reservoirs, our urban reservoirs. Um, An MIF balances the need for water supply with the ecological health of the streams. And that's really, that's the basis of what it is and why um, why we do that. We're balancing human need and ecological need and trying to find somewhere in the middle that provides both. Um, so releases, we have releases from our urban water supply reservoirs to the downstream. Um, and just in the pictures, just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is the South of Ravana uh, release <coughs> comes through this pipe um, and that's at a very low flow rate. Um, and I should also say that we only have to release from there when the reservoirs aren't spilling. It's not really a problem as long as the reservoir is spilling, the downstream areas are getting plenty of water. But if we didn't release when they stopped spilling, then that, that would be bad. Um, so we do. And this, we were doing some calibration on this. So if this gives you any idea, this amount of water coming out of there, it's about 17.2 million gallons over the whole day if we did it all day long. So that is South Urbana. And then this is Sugar Hollow. And this is actually a newer picture where we're, we're doing some work up at Sugar Hollow to replace the, the gate that was across the reservoir. Um, so it's, it is uh, spilling there. So we would not typically be releasing, but the, the downstream release comes out of this pipe. And it's a maximum of 10 million gallons a day when the reservoir is not spilling. So that's our um, summary of several different topics and we'd be glad to answer any questions. Yeah, Andrea, we've had a, a couple of questions uh, come in related to what you were talking about. Um, one is uh, from Ida, she asks, what effect does the copper sulfate have on multicellular vegetation downstream on the fish food web. Interesting. We we I I had mentioned just a few slides ago that we have done studies of the sediment in the reservoirs to see if we are seeing it accumulate. Um, and my understanding is that the copper sulfate can go into the sediments. And we did see that there's more copper sulfate in the sediments at Beaver Creek 
than there are in the sediments at South Arena, but the consultant indicated that neither was of a toxic nature or level. Um, we have not done specific downstream analyses of um, water quality or the copper sulfate impact downstream. We, we have not done that to date. Great, thank you. Um, another question came in, uh, what construction is underway at the dam at Sugar Hollow? Jennifer, you wanna answer that one? Sure. So the Sugar Hollow Dam, the, the larger dam was built in the mid to late 1940s. And um, if anyone lived here in the 1990s, you'll remember there was a very large rain event. Um, and it caused a landslide into the Sugar Hollow Reservoir. We lost about a third of the volume of the reservoir. And there was some um, debris that was washed up against the dam. And so a, a pretty extensive review of the dam for dam safety was done at that point. And in the late 1990s, an upgrade of the dam was done that put in rock anchors and took off the metal gates that used to be on the top of the dam and replaced them with a air actuated rubber bladder about five feet tall and that rubber bladder is about 20 years old at this point and so we are replacing it and that some people call it a rubber bladder some people call it a rubber gate um and it it actuates with air and goes up and down and right now uh we have removed the old rubber gate and we are waiting for the new rubber gate to be manufactured. And this spring we'll be putting the new rubber gate on and replacing all of the control equipment and telemetry and, and all of that sort of thing. So. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, we've got a few more questions coming in. Just a reminder to folks, go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A. And I noticed there was one person calling in earlier. So if you're calling in by phone, you can also press star nine to ask a question and we will unmute you. Okay, um, so uh, next question, does the dry season outflow from Sugar Hollow Reservoir affect the ecosystems downstream in terms of temperature and dissolved oxygen? Um, it, we've done some studies on that to see um, what is particularly what dissolved oxygen looks like um, downstream of the dam. And so one thing that you have to think about if when the reservoir is spilling, that's a lot of water coming down uh, the spillway that smashes into the into the basin at the bottom and kind of gets a little bit aerated. Um, so we have looked at that. That is um, the water quality up there is really good. That's a trout stream, uh, not a designated trout stream, but Trout Unlimited has the permission to have its members out there. So we know that the system um, that's in place right now does protect uh, the trout particularly, but so we think that it does. Great, thank you. Um, so a few more questions. How does water quality vary between the different water intake points, reservoir water sources versus direct river withdrawals, for example? Is more chlorine or other treatment measures required for the direct river withdrawals? That's a good question. Um, I'm gonna start that one and, and Jennifer jump in if you want to. So in each of the reservoirs we have um, different locations along our intake towers that we can pull water in. So, and if you think about those um, drawings that I had that showed the epilimnion, the hypolimnion and all of that, we have, particularly at South Ravana, we have gates in each of those locations. So based on our water quality data that we have, we can use that as a tool for our water uh, system managers to decide to from what level they want to pull water. Um, Jennifer, did you, what was the, the end of the question about chlorine? Sure, I can, sure I can jump in too. So we only have um, one direct river intake, uh, and that is the North Urbana River. Um, and the rest of our intakes are all reservoir based. And so they come out of South Fork, which is a run of the river, technically a run of the river reservoir, but nevertheless a reservoir as opposed to just the river. Um, and then Ragged Mountain, Sugar Hollow. 
and Beaver Creek and Toady are all come out of the, the reservoir. So what's interesting is that each watershed sort of has a unique signature. And if you look at the North Fork River, which is our only direct river intake, um, it's extremely flashy. And there's a high amount of erosion that happens in that, in that watershed. So when we get very high flow events, we have pretty turbid water that comes into that plant. And it requires a, a, a fair amount of uh, care by the operators to make sure that, that we can treat to uh, the appropriate standards. And so each watershed has its own signature and each watershed requires different treatment at, based on temperature, time of year, turbidity, rainfall, um, and organic carbon in the incoming water. So the operation staff actually um, spends a fair amount of time every day monitoring and sending off for testing. We test our raw and finished waters every day and then they can adjust treatment based on what they see for all of those different parameters. So I'm not sure I can directly answer. Um, chlorine is only a, a piece of the treatment puzzle. Um, we, we have other, uh, other processes that really are more directly related to getting sediment and things that come with sediment out of the water. And then we also treat, um, as some of you may know, we also treat the water with granular activated carbon on the backside of our treatment plants. And that granular activated carbon is sort of state of the art um, water treatment. And that really um, is highly dependent on the organic, dissolved organic carbon that, that comes into the to the facility. And again, each water during each season, during each temperature kind of has a different fingerprint and they're trying to hit certain targets based on that fingerprint that's coming in on that any, any given one day. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so next question, uh, does the proximity of I-64 pose additional issues for RMR? You, you want me to jump on that one, Andrea, or you? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and- Yeah, I'm that. sorry, go ahead. You're no, good. it's okay. Yeah. Um, so when we designed, Ragged Mountain um, Reservoir was designed and built um, in its earliest conception in 1885 and expanded in 1908 and then expanded in 2012 to 2014. And uh, Interstate 64 was built in the mid 60s around the reservoir expressly. If you look at the original design drawings, um, it was intended to go around the reservoir. And so um, the watershed for Ragged Mountain is very small. And so there's a very small area of, of 64 that has the potential to drain towards the reservoir. And that it's the, there's a basically a rock cut in the, uh, interstate and that small area drains down the, the slope um, naturally. And what we've done in working with Virginia Department of Transportation is we've put in uh, stormwater diversion berms on that, that area. We've also got some um, uh, turbidity curtains we've put into the reservoir itself. And uh, we, we do routine inspections and then we work with VDOT on and we have some spill prevention um, equipment that we use uh, and have deployed out at that reservoir as well, should there ever be a spill. The, the good news is that the, the interstate is about um, 60 or 70 feet above the water surface elevation. And so um, there is some time to respond. Additionally, we can shut intakes to the reservoir and respond um, and still supply water through the rest of our system. So we have enough redundancy built into the system to, to address those, those concerns. So we have given thought to how, how we would deal with an issue and also how to uh, prevent an issue at Ragged Mountain. Thanks, Jennifer. It looks like we've got uh, two more questions. So if anyone else out there has a question, go ahead and type it into the Q&A box. Um, the next one is from Carol. She asks, what are your biggest worries about our water supply? Interesting question. It is. Um, you want to yeah, go, take, go you ahead. take a crack at that or would you like me to? I could take a crack at that. Sure. Um, and then just add to it what you'd like. 
So I think what are my biggest worries in water supply? It, for me, it has to do, um, my biggest concern is the resiliency and redundancy that Jennifer was talking about. Um, and having our system set up in such a way that we have a little bit stronger backdrop for getting water around the system. So for instance, we had South Ravana um, can pump to certain areas, observatory can pump to certain areas, but there are areas we can't do from just one reservoir. Um, so the pipeline and being able to move the water to Ragged Mountain is very important for that. So I would say resiliency and redundancy is a concern of mine. Which I would emphasize or agree with that our capital improvement plan for the next 15 years has a fair number of projects yeah. that are working to address that interconnectivity on both the raw water side and the finished water side so that um, our system is more, uh, more uniform connected from all directions. Right. I would agree. Can, can I, hey Kim, can I also, um, Ida had had asked for a, or made a, a statement or a question about Sugar Hollow in response to Andrea's answer earlier about releases. Yeah. And I was wondering sure. if I could go could ahead. Speak I, I might that. have missed it. Yeah, please do. Yeah, no, no worries. So just to clarify, when we release water from Sugar Hollow Dam in the summer, it is not released from the bottom of the dam. Um, so what happens at Sugar Hollow is there's an intake tower at on the water side of the dam, and that intake tower goes from top to bottom, and there's gates at different elevations, and water drops through those gates into the bottom of the tower and then out the pipe at the bottom. So while the pipe looks like it's coming out of the bottom of the dam, it's actually taking water from whatever elevation we have the gates open. And so in the summertime, most of the time, the water is actually coming from the surface of the, the lake and then being released to the stream below. So it, it's not coming from the bottom of the reservoir, just, just as a point of clarification. Got it, thank you for that. Um... So it looks like we've got one more question here. Again, last chance, folks, put your questions in the Q&A. Um, this last one says, how will sedimentation of South Rivanna be addressed in the future? If not, what is the plan to make up the deficit? Um, great question. Uh, it's sort of the, the obvious one when you look at those the graphs and the numbers. I, I, uh, I appreciate you're asking that, Jim. So the South Ravana Reservoir was designed in the 1960s, mid 60s. And what's interesting is it was thought that it was going to have sedimentation right from the get go. And so there was a pool designed into below the lowest intake into it where sediment could accumulate and not affect water supply. And what's interesting is that the sedimentation rate that has happened in the South Fork Reservoir while is high compared to some of our other reservoirs is actually less than what was anticipated in the original design. And so there, there's a, several items that kind of are related to that. And one is that um, the water supply will be able to still come out of the reservoir even when there's sediment in, in the reservoir. And so it will just be a, a lower volume of water stored there. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is that we are doing routine bathymetric surveys in the South Ravana Reservoir so that we can monitor how quickly it's sedimenting in, whether um, major storm events like the one we had in 2018 have an impact on how much sediment is accumulating. There is a theory that nature may address this issue all on its own. Um, as the pool gets smaller and smaller, the velocity of the water coming in during big events, big storm events, gets faster and faster, and it may carry some of the sediment over the dam and, and sort of scour out the reservoir itself. So we are monitoring that on a fairly routine basis. And then um, the thought is that we will have to address that as necessary. And, and then it becomes the question of total water supply availability. And the pipeline from Ragged Mountain to South Ravana that we've talked about a couple times will also increase the operational safe yield of the system. 
And so when that pipeline gets built, we will have um, enough water to meet the entire planning period that we talked about earlier in the, in the talk. So hopefully um, we're able to monitor and address the South Fork sedimentation issue as, as it becomes more of an issue. Thanks, Jennifer. And you were just talking about the pipeline, so you may have answered this question, but it's uh, one more question came in that says, why is it that the pipeline from Sugar Hollow Dam to Ragged Mountain is not being replaced? Oh, that's a that's another great question. And it's um, what's interesting is during from 2002 to 2012, the community engaged in a massive undertaking of reviewing water supply and desires for the future and how how we as a community want to supply water and move water around. Um, and, and what's interesting is Sugar Hollow only has, I think Andrea pointed out, um, an 18 square mile drainage basin. And so you will see that at times during the summertime when we're using Sugar Hollow water, the reservoir um, does drop below full and sometimes drops significantly below full. And that currently is our only method of supplying refill water to Ragged Mountain. And so we move water at about 3 million gallons a day, maximum flow rate um, during the times that we need to refill Ragged Mountain. And that, so that watershed cannot provide the kind of volume that we're potentially looking at into the future for Ragged Mountain. The, the other piece of the puzzle is that um, the community really wanted us to move away from Ragged uh, Sugar Hollow as a, as a direct piped source and move to a larger watershed area, the South Fork Ravana Reservoir. Um, again, Andrea's numbers were, I think 249 square miles of drainage area compared to the 18 that are at Sugar Hollow. And so there is just generally more water available at, down at South Ravana. And so we have to replace the pipe and we need a bigger pipe and we need more volume. And so all of those things became available um, when you look at South Ravana and it became sort of the great compromise, if you will, um, during the 2005 to 2012 water supply debates. And it was, um, the compromise position of being able to move water from where there's ample supply to where there's ample storage. Thanks, Jennifer. And I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Um, so thank you both Andrea and Jennifer so much. This has been really interesting. Uh, I've definitely learned a lot. And uh, before we close, I wanted to just uh, let uh, Laurel Williamson, who's our watershed stewardship manager, share an opportunity about drinking water uh, testing. Sure. Thanks, Kim. Uh, we've been talking about water supply here today. So this seemed like a good time to give a plug for um, any of you who are on well or, um, or a cistern or a um, spring. Of course, we haven't been talking about those today, but um, if you are on those and, and you're in the rural part of Almoral County um, or even within the city of Charlottesville, the I put a link in the chat box that um, will tell you about a drinking water testing opportunity through Virginia Cooperative Extension that is a fairly low cost for uh, testing quite a few different parameters in your in your uh, tap water. So give that a look if you're interested and, and uh, it requires you to sign up ahead, uh, but the actual testing happens in May. Great, thank you, Laurel. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming. I hope you, that you'll join us next week. Uh, we're gonna hear about our water protection policies and programs. So please join us at the same time at, at noon next week. Thanks everyone. Thanks thank you very much. Us. Thank we you very much for having us, yeah.